Dear Indian friends, greetings from Bellitalia 88 and welcome back. I am Katrina Brazzi Castracane, I am an historian and I am here in collaboration with the Italian Culture Center in New Delhi. Today in particular I am here to share with you the first of two appointments thought and realized that during this month of December 2020, two appointments dedicated to the rediscovery of the Italian city of Milan. What we are going to talk about today is related with the peculiarities of this city that uh, too often uh, is just considered as the uh, economical capital of uh, Italy, but that is instead an important cultural city full of different kind of masterpieces realized during the centuries. The uh, starting point of this lecture today is related with uh, the idea that uh, Milan is uh, already a capital of uh, the future. This means uh, that this important uh, uh, town uh, with an important and huge uh, history is uh, uh, today an important uh, example of uh, cosmopolitan uh, reality, full of uh, different kind of interesting details, including money, industry, but also fashion, gourmet, art, music, uh, theater, music, and uh, all uh, that uh, uh, peculiarities uh, that are so important to uh, imagine an alive city. The origin of this uh, town uh, is uh, related according to the historians uh, with uh, the girls that found it around uh, 600 BC uh, in that area that later will be called the Chisipin Gaul. Um, in 222 BC, the Romans conquered the uh, city and uh, annexed it uh, to the Roman Empire, uh, getting uh, the name of uh, Mediolanum, that just means in the middle of the plain. The Latin uh, name was uh, transformed into the Italian form of Milan. During uh, the Roman age, uh, Milan quickly became one of the most remarkable uh, uh, towns of the empire, so important uh, to uh, became from 292 AD the effective capital of uh, the Western Roman Empire. Um, this is a map of uh, the Roman Milan and uh, a map that shows us uh, the perfect uh, declination of this uh, important city with a uh, thorough with different kind of uh, basilicas and uh, important and huge buildings. And the city was so important that in AD 313 the Emperor Constantine uh, published from there an important edict that was named after him, this is in fact the Edicto di Costantino, uh, edict that was the first step for the religious tolerance inside the Roman Empire. The golden age of this city um, was uh, actually the Middle Age because uh, that was the moment after the dramatic period started with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, uh, the period when uh, Milan was able to become an important uh, and uh, um, city estate, uh, a sort of uh, uh, autonomous kingdom uh, that will be later called Daki. Three are the dynasties that transformed the history and landscape of Milan during that time or uh, since that time. First of all, the Torrianis, and in the lower part of this slide, you are seeing the cut on arms of each dynasty, then the Viscontis, and eventually the Sforzas. 
The Viscontis uh, and the Sforzas in particular represented uh, the families uh, that uh, really um, were in charge to transform Milan into a modern ideal of uh, capital of the north of Italy, but uh, of Europe. Uh, in particular, they uh, posed the uh, stone to create uh, these uh, important uh, dachi, and they realized uh, two important uh, uh, buildings that still today um, are uh, some uh, among the remarkable aspect of the landscape of this uh, city. In particular, with uh, the figures of Gian Galeazzo Visconti, the first man who gained uh, the uh, title of Duke of Milan at the end of the 14th century, we realized uh, uh, two important uh, buildings. First of all, the cathedral that will be object of the last part of this conference, but also the uh, castle that uh, still today is uh, one of the most remarkable monument but also cultural uh, space of Milan. Um, this is uh, the uh, imaging of uh, Gian Galeazzo Visconti that will be remembered as uh, the first Duke of Milan, a sort of uh, important uh, ruler of uh, any time. His father, uh, Galeazzo II, was actually the man who decided to build the uh, first uh, um, fort uh, of uh, Milan that was called uh, during that time Fort of uh, Porta Gioia. Uh, he realized uh, part of uh, the medieval wall and the fort uh, inside uh, one part of this uh, wall and uh, the fort that uh, during the next century was completely transformed to be uh, the ideal castle of that time was uh, used uh, uh, and adopted by the family as the official residence under the reign of the last of the Viscontes, Filippo Maria. One daughter of Filippo Maria, Bianca Visconti, was the girl who married in 1441 uh, a soldier uh, in Italian condottiere uh, that just means uh, leader of a band of mercenaries. His name is Francesco Sforza and uh, he uh, will be um, in 1450 the first Duke of Milan with this certain name. This couple had eight sons, including Ludovico il Moro, that is still today the uh, iconical uh, um, Duke of Milan, the man who was able to transform his card with the help of uh, the most remarkable artist of that time. He was also a fine diplomatist and was the man who um, was able to uh, call to Milan two important artists among the other, Donato Bramante and Leonardo da Vinci, that arrived in Milan to transform the city into a masterpiece of a modern age. Leonardo da Vinci in particular, that could be considered a genius uh, of any time, realized in Milan, uh, for the will of uh, Ludovico il Moro, different kind of uh, masterpiece, including an important decoration inside the castle that we discovered just at the end of the 19th century, with the help of an important architect, Luca Beltrami, who was able to uh, make an important and huge restoration of the medieval Milan, uh, according to the taste so popular during the end of the 19th century. Uh, in this case, the decoration signed by Leonardo da Vinci was found inside a uh, hall that was completely covered by wooden boards that uh, 
still today um, gave the name to uh, the hall that is called in Italian Sala delle Asse. Asse just means wooden boards. Uh, under these wooden boards, the um, art historians find a different kind of decoration realized uh, by the hand of Leonardo. On the wall, in the lower part of the hall, uh, they find uh, a uh, monochrome uh, with a different kind of representation of uh, trunks but uh, also roof uh, as you can see in these uh, uh, part uh, elements that were uh, realized to create a natural scenery on uh, that part of the world. In the higher part uh, uh, Leonardo realized um, a sort of uh, um, intricate decoration uh, that was uh, realized to be a sort of uh, arboreal pergola uh, and uh, he realized it just uh, um, working with 16 different kind of mulberry trees um, realized and painted as the uh, sort of uh, forest inside the old um, the choice of the mulberry trees, um, the choice of it was uh, related uh, with uh, the figures of um, Ludovico il Moro. Um, first of all, because uh, he was known as uh, il Moro in reference to both his uh, dark uh, complexion, but also in his rule in the spread of the mulberry tree plantation on which Lombardy's flourishing silk production was based. The silk was basically one of the first element, really elements related with the richness of Milan during that time. Another uh, as important aspect uh, of the castle uh, today is that uh, it was uh, completely transformed uh, into a cultural museum, a cultural uh, space for the exhibition during the 20th centuries. And uh, today, um, six are uh, the different collections that are housed inside the uh, castle. Um, among uh, the uh, huge quantities of masterpieces that still today are housed inside the castle, I choose for you one important uh, sculptor that is uh, the last masterpiece signed by Michelangelo Buonarroti. Here in front of you there is the Pietà Rondanini that is uh, a sort of uh, miracle in the history of uh, the art. In particular this uh, statue named after the family that was the owner of the palace uh, where uh, the statue was found in the first part of the 19th century. So the Rondanini family and the palace uh, still today is uh, one of uh, the architectural masterpiece in Rome. This status, I was uh, saying, is uh, the unfinished uh, and uh, the last masterpiece of Michelangelo. First of all, found uh, inside his studio in Rome um, after his death in 1564, um, eventually um, found again inside the uh, Palazzo Rondanini, but uh, completely disappeared during the central centuries of the modern age. Since 1952 is a part of the important collection of the Castello Sforzesco Museum. Um, this uh, unfinished masterpiece just shows us uh, um, the perfect uh, relationship between uh, the body of uh, the Holy Virgin Mary, the Madonna, 
that here uh, um, he is standing and supporting the dead body of Jesus, uh, her son, after the crucifixion. Uh, this masterpiece uh, is uh, maybe a second uh, uh, version of the original one, um, realized by uh, Michelangelo uh, during the last part of his life. In this case, from this point of view, you can see that on the stone there is another kind of work, maybe a first kind of work uh, that was transformed, just working on the stone in the other point of view of this statue. The peculiarities of this masterpiece is uh, in this way to uh, be a sort of uh, rising masterpiece full of uh, um, different kind of meanings including the important transformation uh, from the stone to something else, to something alive. Um, to understand exactly what I'm trying to say to you, uh, it's important to, to compare those different uh, kind of uh, statues, uh, realized with uh, the, the same theme, the Pietas by Michelangelo in two different moments of his life. First of all, uh, the Pietas uh, named after uh, the place uh, where uh, still today he is uh, the um, Vatican State in Rome that you can see uh, with uh, these uh, white and pure marble and uh, in uh, the opposite side uh, the Rondanini Pietas that uh, for us means something completely different um, from the other. Uh, these two statues are two different icons of beauty. Um, just seeing the uh, Pietà Vaticana, you can uh, um, imagine that the aim of the master was uh, realized something that could be able to um, talk the ability of the master to realize that something alive just working with the stone. But uh, the end of uh, this uh, work, the result of this work, uh, should be not to seeing uh, the stone, but just see the body of the Virgin Mary and Christ. On the opposite side, in the other way, the Rondanini Pietas was uh, created to uh, be a perfect uh, icon of something different full of archaical suggestion and the primitive faith, something that uh, was realized to create a link between the stone and the body of the Holy Virgin Mary and Christ. Um, the result of this work was to create just one body. Uh, the dramatic idea of uh, uh, the, the body of a mother that uh, is uh, surrounding uh, the body of uh, the death body of his son and uh, the uh, idea of uh, these uh, um, dramatical feelings that uh, is uh, more visible uh, just uh, seeing uh, to the ability of Michelangelo uh, to reduce everything down to the essential reviving uh, an important uh, iconographic uh, model from the medieval uh, times. Ludovico il Moro uh, decided also to realize other kind of project in Milan using the genius of Donato Bramante and Leonardo da Vinci, including the um, renovation of this important monastery and church uh, dedicated to Santa Maria delle Grazie, this uh, important building that you can see here colored uh, just using uh, these um, 
original photograph. Um, they, these artists both realize something new inside the monastery. Uh, two different uh, um, masterpieces related with uh, their different uh, kind of abilities. In particular, Bramante realized the new tribune uh, in the church of Santa Maria delle Grazie, um, tribune that was realized, as you can see with this picture, um, with the aim to celebrate the perfect uh, classical idea of temple. This uh, tribune is a sort of um, perfect postcard from Renaissance and is uh, quite similar to other kind of architectural masterpieces realized by Bramante in Rome and other cities of Italy. Um, on the other way, Leonardo was called to um, realize an important fresco of Christ at, at the Last Supper inside the refectory of uh, this uh, monastery. Uh, the Last Supper, uh, a scene with Christ, uh, surrounded by 12 apostles. This masterpiece is a sort of uh, vanishing masterpiece and one of the most important uh, um, representation of the Last Supper never realized. Um, it was uh, relied by um, Leonardo at the end of the 15th century, but the problem is that here Leonardo completely abandoned the traditional method of fresco painting, um, deciding to paint the scene dry on the wall of the refectory. This is uh, one of uh, the most remarkable reasons why this masterpiece uh, is slowly disappearing. The idea of this representation was uh, to um, show us the scene um, that took place when uh, Christ decided uh, during uh, this uh, Last uh, Supper to uh, declare that one among the apostles um, should uh, pray, betray him and uh, uh, from that moment started the last part of the life of Christ and also the miracle of the Eucharist. Um, the genius of Leonardo was so able to create a sort of modern innovation in painting, but also because he was able to create a sort of modern idea of a psychological kind of representation. In fact, according to Giorgio Vasari, you can read with his word that the, she, the scene that is in front of us in this moment uh, is uh, the perfect uh, representation of the moment when all the apostles um, start talking about what the Christ uh, had already said and uh, just seeing the faces and the end you can think and imagine the feelings of the apostles including love, fear or indignation and something different aspect of each one that is important to understand understand the uh, protagonist and main characters of that moment. But uh, for Ludovico il Moro, uh, Leonardo was uh, also an important engineer and uh, he um, tried to resolve uh, an old and ancient problem of Milan that still today is impossible to resolve. Milan uh, has no connection to the sea, uh, neither a direct river connection. 
um, the only solution that was found at the end of the Middle Ages was uh, to uh, build important artificial canals to use as main roads. Um, two in particular uh, were the Navilla realized to uh, be um, this new kind of main street, the Naviglio Grande and Naviglio della Martesana, uh, related with uh, two important uh, rivers, uh, the Ticino and uh, the Adda. During uh, the Milan uh, um, part uh, of uh, his life, Leonardo realized uh, uh, projects and drawings uh, uh, has uh, the examples that you are seeing with this slide um, that just show us the abilities of this master not just to paint or realize something related with uh, the um, generic idea of art, but also to to um, create something that was uh, um, important to transform the city uh, into a modern uh, one. In particular, in this case, uh, you can see the map of Milan with a different kind of uh, works and um, mathematical aspect that uh, um, were used by Leonardo to um, think uh, to a uh, sort of project uh, to uh, link together different parts uh, um, related with the natural presence of water and uh, downtown and the center of uh, Milan. During the next centuries, uh, um, some of these projects were used by uh, the Milanese uh, rulers uh, to transform the city. Today, uh, the area of Milan dominated by these uh, artificial canals that is called the Navigli um, is uh, one of uh, the most uh, cool area of the city. A neighborhood completely dominated by uh, bar shops or um, outdoor uh, exhibition and uh, is uh, the perfect place to enjoy the uh, aperitif just sitting in front of the water thinking that uh, for uh, a small time you are not in Milan but into uh, another place a sort of uh, little Venice because this is another nickname of the Navigli. Uh, during the centuries, the Navigli had an important uh, um, role uh, inside the transformation of Milan. In particular, the Naviglio Grande was used uh, to be um, the highway to the marble that were uh, um, used uh, to build the important uh, cathedral of Milan, marble death used to arrive from the uh, Candoglia quarries, um, quarries uh, placed on the Toce rivers. Um, the project of this cathedral uh, is one of the most remarkable elements that could help us to understand the long period of transformation of Milan, because the uh, construction of it started in 1386 but ended in 1965 and the project of this huge cathedral was realized um, on the same area that was once already occupied by the presence of two important basilicas Santa Tecla and Santa Ambrosa to uh, main uh, Saint Patron of Milan. The design to realize that uh, this uh, uh, masterpiece of uh, architecture was uh, chosen um, according to the uh, taste of the time uh, on uh, using the Gothic one and uh, was Gian Galeazzo Visconti, the first lord of Milan, that decided to use the Candoglia marble instead of the traditional Lombard brick. 
another important aspect to talk about the cathedral is that during the century this became a, a sort of cosmopolitan project because um, engineers, architects, sculptors, stone cutters arrived during the past to Milan to help the municipality to create this important kind of cathedral. And uh, it uh, became during the centuries um, a lively space for uh, exchange of uh, the most diverse ideas, experience, and skills from workers from all the different parts of Europe. Um, in this way, uh, the Cathedral of Milan uh, is uh, still today a sort of important. Uh, crossroads of people and culture that uh, are able to talk a new kind of language using the language of the past, in particular in this case the taste of Gothic vision of architecture. Um, today the huge cathedral uh, is uh, also uh, remarked by this important uh, marble forest of uh, spires, um, spires that uh, are more than a thousand, and uh, each mounted with a statue depicting important people in Milan's history and different characters uh, of the Bible. Uh, in particular, the highest spire of the temple is dominated by this uh, gilded bronze statue, the Madonnina di Milano, sculpted by Giuseppe Perigo in uh, 1774 and uh, became, uh, during uh, the contemporary uh, history of Milan, the icon of this uh, city. Um, the facade was uh, uh, finished for the will of uh, Napoleon III, that year was uh, crowned uh, as uh, the king of uh, Italy, but after him, during the next century, um, the construction and the decoration continued um, with uh, the realization in particular of uh, these uh, several stained glass windows uh, that are still today uh, some of the most remarkable um, elements of this uh, part of the uh, cathedral. The interior is uh, quite similar to other examples of Gothic cathedral um, realized uh, in different parts of Europe. Uh, you can uh, um, feel uh, different kind of feelings uh, just entering inside uh, the uh, cathedral, something uh, related with uh, the um, uh, other interpretation of uh, ascetism or uh, dark and light uh, as the uh, touchable representation of God, but completely different um, from other examples of Gothic cathedral is the floor that was realized by Pellegrino Tibaldi uh, um, starting at the end of the Renaissance time, but was realized during the next centuries, just using three different kinds of um, colored marble. First of all, the white candoglia one, um, fused with the uh, Varenna black and the Arzo red. The result is something amazing. Another important aspect of uh, this uh, cathedral is is uh, the present uh, um, once outside the cathedral, now, um, now inside it, of this uh, statue represented uh, the uh, body of the San Bartholomew's kind. Um, this statue that was realized by the master uh, sculptor Marco da Grate uh, in 1562 uh, was realized not just to celebrate uh, the glory or the faith of 
of this saint, but to be a perfect study of human anatomy. Um, in particular, the statue was realized to be an exercise, um, realized according to the taste of that time, uh, time uh, when the first studies of anatomy and uh, the section of the body were published and uh, this uh, is uh, a sort of uh, great uh, examples of uh, the idea to link together different kind uh, of uh, uh, materials and also elements that could talk uh, the idea of uh, art and faith uh, as uh, a sort of uh, Mm, fused reinterpretation of modernity realized uh, by different kind of artists uh, including uh, the scientist the uh, lesson by leonardo was uh, so popular during that time um, another important aspect inside the cathedral is that there is uh, the largest organ of Italy. Uh, organ realized in the middle part of the 20th centuries uh, and that is uh, still today a sort of giant of music. It is formed by uh, something around 15,800 pipes uh, and uh, the highest among them being over nine meters high. Um, every Sunday this organ played a different kind of music and uh, uh, this instrument uh, has the ability to uh, let that music arrive um, in all the different parts of the cathedral. But music is one of the most important aspect of Milan but in particular of this cathedral because uh, the music chapel of the Duomo um, was uh, the oldest cultural institution that was founded uh, in uh, this uh, town. Uh, it was founded uh, around um, 1402. Um, during that period the first uh, maestro di cappella, master of chapel was uh, Matteo da Perugia and still today with uh, the uh, organ the music chapel uh, accompanies uh, the uh, most remarkable uh, religious uh, feast uh, that uh, you can imagine um, take place inside uh, this uh, cathedral. Um, the cathedral is uh, uh, posed uh, in the central part, uh, as you can see with uh, this uh, original map of the uh, 18th centuries, um, in the central part uh, of this uh, square, uh, that uh, um, is uh, a sort of important area of something around 17,000 meters. Um, uh, square and uh, in this case it's important uh, to notice uh, that uh, the square was uh, named after the present of uh, the uh, cathedral but that is also remarked uh, by the presence of two other important buildings first of all the royal palace uh, and the Vittorio Emanuele Gallery um, as you can see with uh, this panoramic photo photograph, uh, the royal palace and the gallery uh, named after the uh, name of the first uh, queen, uh, the first king of uh, Italy, um, surround uh, the uh, cathedral to create a sort of a, um, particular representation of uh, three different kind of uh, power. And in particular, the royal palace uh, was uh, realized to be the important uh, place destined uh, to have the uh, most remarkable part of the government of Milan. Uh, 
um, it was uh, realized um, since the Middle Age uh, to be the house uh, of uh, the uh, Khammon and uh, was completely transformed during the first part of the 16th century um, for the will of uh, uh, the French uh, domination uh, to be the house uh, of uh, the court. Um, since that time uh, the palace became uh, the official uh, ducal palace of Milan. Um, it was uh, during the next century um, rebuilt uh, several times. In particular, uh, it was completely transformed uh, into something modern by the end of an important architect, Pier Marini, uh, for the will of the Austrians. And uh, since that time, since the last part of the 18th centuries, the palace acquired a neoclassical classical appearance. From then on it became the palace of the rulers of Milan, comprising Maria Teresa d'Austria, but also Napoleon III. With this old photograph you can see the bedroom of the emperors. That is something that could really help us to imagine which was the atmosphere inside that palace during that time. Um, one of the masterpieces relied inside the palace by the end of Pier Marini was uh, the Cariati di All, an important uh, and uh, so um, great uh, um, representation of a sort of uh, new all uh, destined to house uh, and to host um, different uh, uh, dinners and uh, dance uh, parties uh, according to the taste of that time. This important uh, room uh, the, named after the presence of the uh, Cariati that uh, are just uh, these uh, sort of reinterpretation of columns that you can still surround it, all the central part of the hall um, was completely destroyed um, during a British bombi at bombing attack in August 1943. And uh, the result um, of uh, uh, the bombs, but also of the fires after the uh, bombs, uh, is uh, what you can see with uh, this uh, picture. This um, post-apocalyptic uh, uh, place was uh, chosen uh, as uh, a sign uh, of uh, rebirth by the master uh, uh, Pablo Picasso to uh, organize an important art exhibition in 1953, which most notably featured uh, uh, Guernica, and uh, uh, Guernica in particular, that uh, is a sort of a live uh, poster uh, against uh, war and uh, violence uh, is uh, here in front of you in the same uh, position where it was uh, posed during uh, that uh, year. This is a sort of uh, great uh, um, representation of uh, the strong force uh, of art against uh, violence and uh, war. Um, on the opposite side of uh, the square, you can find uh, the uh, gallery named after uh, the King uh, Vittorio Emanuele II, the first king of Italy. Um, it was uh, realized uh, by the end of the architect Giuseppe Mengoni at the end of the 19th century to be the first shopping malls of uh, the city. It was uh, realized uh, as a temple a temple uh, for shopping uh, and a temple uh, uh, for different kind of uh, brands and it was realized just using glass and uh, 
cast uh, iron uh, death uh, with uh, the bricks uh, were used uh, as uh, the main materials to realize uh, these new kind of uh, architecture uh, that were realized according to that taste uh, of that time called in Italy Stile Liberty. The um, gallery was uh, created to be a passage uh, that linked together the uh, square uh, dominated by the presence of the cathedral and the place of Santa Maria della Scala. Um, here you can see the line uh, between two different, uh, these two different squares. Um, the heart of this building is uh, uh, an octagonal space um, dominated and topped by this glass dome. Um, the vault, uh, the third vault uh, around the dome um, were painted uh, with uh, lunettes uh, representing representing four different continents, in this case uh, you are seeing uh, the America, and uh, uh, on the floor of this uh, heart uh, of the palace uh, you can find uh, uh, different kind of decoration realized uh, around uh, the Captain Harms of the Savoy family, um, the dynasty of the first uh, uh, kings of Italy, but also the elements that represent the uh, first the third uh, capital of Italy, uh, Turin, Florence and Rome, and the last one is uh, Milan has the economical one. Um, today uh, the gallery is the Milan's drawing room and is completely dominated uh, by the present time important shop from world-class stylists and brands. Um, during the second appointment, we will talk about uh, that neighborhood in Milan that is called Quadrilatero della Moda, a sort of neighborhood uh, just uh, dominated by the presence of uh, fashions. And uh, you have to imagine that is, uh, uh, this is uh, the perfect uh, place to uh, spend uh, uh, some time uh, just enjoying uh, these uh, alive uh, um, aspects of the contemporary Milan. But uh, um, I'm going uh, to end uh, this uh, lecture talking about uh, this important place posed at the end of the gallery in the opposite side of the um, Cathedral Square, the Theatre of La Scala, that is uh, one of the principal opera houses in the world uh, and also, of course, the leading Italian house. Um, it was realized for the will of the Empress Maria Teresa d'Austria at the end of the 16th century, but um, since uh, 1872 um, it became property of the municipality of Milan. It was named uh, in this way after the church of uh, St. Mary to Stairway that was uh, destroyed to realize uh, another um, kind of uh, area for the city and uh, today is a sort of icon of beauty, music, opera, but also uh, dance. In particular, uh, since the 1951, uh, the season of this theater starts uh, on uh, uh, December 7, day of uh, St. Ambrogio, uh, as uh, I was uh, uh, saying, uh, one of the main uh, Saint Patron of uh, Milan, uh, the idea uh, of this kind of celebration that is a sort of uh, uh, international gala comparable uh, to the Oscar night was by Victor de Sabata that was uh, at that time the official director of the theater and uh, that uh, night of the 7th December 1951 the queen of the night was Maria Callas. That uh, was here to uh, be the protagonist of uh, an important masterpiece by Giuseppe Verdi um, 
title uh, the Vespri Siciliani. Since that year, every, day, every year, the uh, season of uh, uh, La Scala started on the 7th of December. And uh, this uh, happened uh, still uh, during this uh, particular year. Because uh, today, um, according uh, with the impossibility to uh, house and to host people inside the uh, theatre, the La Scala uh, was completely transformed into something new, a sort of a perfect place to celebrate the heart and uh, everyone uh, could uh, uh, be uh, the uh, first uh, important uh, uh, spectator of this uh, representation just using uh, the streaming, just uh, seeing the TV, the PC or the radio to be the protagonist among uh, other important artists of uh, this uh, night that uh, in particular during this a year was uh, uh, thought to be the touchable proof that Milan is alive and also that the culture is alive. Um, at this point uh, I just stop sharing with you my screen to say to you that uh, we will see during the second appointment of this month destined to uh, rediscover together other important masterpieces of this city that is alive and is important because it's one of the most remarkable Heart of our cultural heritage. See you during the next appointment. Bye bye and thank you very much. Bye.